Income Tax 2023-2024, Alimony and IRA IRA Deduction Tax Software Example. Get ready and some coffee because we're laying down the facts about income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Form 1040 example problem using Lacert Tax Software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to tax software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Starting with our normal starting point, we've got Adam Taxman just trying to avoid a dang tax man. <laughs> Living in Beverly Hills, 90210, single filer, no dependents, starting off with the assumption of W-2 income, 100000 standard deduction, 13850 to get to the taxable income, 86150 which we can mirror on our income tax formula, 100,000 standard deduction, 13,850, 86,150 taxable income tax calculated by the software, 14,266, which we can see on page two of the form 1040. Okay, let's go back to page one, scroll down to the adjustments to income. This is coming from uh, line 20, I'm sorry, line 26 of Schedule 1. So let's go to the Schedule 1, which is the additional income and adjustments to income. We want the adjustments to income, therefore page 2, which is part 2, adjustments to income. We're looking at the alimony paid and IRA deductions. Now I'll go over the alimony paid quickly because we saw it on the income side of things. So when we thought about uh, income, we had the question of can we or do we have to include alimony in income? And we talked about the fact that there's going to be symmetry with regards to the payments in a similar way as you see with other types of payments like W-2 wages, for example, in which case the person paying or the employer paying the wages wants a deduction. Therefore, they're going to record the deduction, but then rat out who they gave the money to with the form W-2, as well as in that case, give withholdings. And so, so that the person that receives the money has to report it as income, because if they don't, the IRS will of course know about it because they have the W-2. And in that case, they have the money because it was withheld. 1099, same kind of situation where the person paying the money wants the deduction. Therefore, they're gonna reduce it on their side and give the 1099 not only to the recipient but also to the government so that the person receiving the money has to report it otherwise the government might come after them same thing happens if alimony was something deductible to the payer you have a divorced situation in theory right and then one spouse is paying the other spouse if the spouse that is making the payment gets a deduction like in a 1099 situation, they would have to rat out the spouse that's receiving the money, putting the social security number on the tax return. And then you also have the date of the agreement because if it's, if it's an old agreement or divorce that happened before the cutoff date, then, then that's when you might be able to deduct it. And that means that the recipient would have to include it in income because if they didn't, You'd have a similar situation like a 1099 that was sent out for somebody that didn't include it in their income. The IRS would most likely uh, see that. So the symmetry here is this one, alimony, this is on the payer side. And then on the recipient side, they would have to include it in income. Now, we're the payer this time. So we're saying, can we deduct it? Note that typically it used to be 
you had to kind of come up with in the divorce agreement and you had sneaky lawyers, of course, that would manipulate the tax consequences. So the complexity obviously benefits the lawyers, right? So they, so then you, you had to differentiate between the child support and the alimony because there was different tax consequences between them. Now they tried to simplify that and take the tax uh, consequences out so that you didn't really have this difference between the payments between child support and alimony, which probably makes the creation of the agreement easier. So this would this whole deduction is there prior to then that adjustment. So if you're going to take the deduction, you would say the uh, recipient's name, Jane, last name, Smith, social security number, you've got to give them the social security number. And then the amount if we paid 1000, and then we want the agreement date. So I'm going to say if it was before the cutoff date, let's say it was on, I think the cutoff date is December 31st, 2018. So I'm going to say it was on uh, 0101, uh, let's say, hold on a second, 010117, 2017. And so I'm going to say, okay. And then if I go back on over, then we're going to say, all right, now we have uh, the deduction here. We've ratted out the other, the spouse, and we have the date there. And so we're taking the deduction that's going to add up uh, down below. We're going to go then to the form 1040. And there's our 100,000. We get to deduct the 1,000, getting us to the 99,000. There's the 13,850 standard deduction has not changed, bringing us to the 85,150. Uh, now, on the spouse's side, what would happen if I go to the schedule? They would be on the schedule one for additional income, and they would have to record, report the alimony as income. So that would be bad for the recipient because they'd have to include it in income, which is usually bad and good for the payer because they get the deduction. But really, it, if you get to make the agreement before without having this uh, in play, meaning in the simplified method that has been put in place after December 31st, then the divorce agreement will reflect the tax consequences, you would think, and you would just be able to make a more simple agreement with everybody being able to understand a little bit better because they don't need to be a tax expert to basically figure out what's actually happening with the agreement. So I think it's actually going to be beneficial on both sides because now they can come up, both sides will have better information to make a, a better choice about what the fair terms would be. But that is that. All right, let's go to the IRA. I'm going to go back on over and say, let's delete this one. Da -da -da, da -da -da. And so I'll say delete it. And so the, the, just, the general rule would be if it was an old agreement uh, that took place, then, then you might still keep having this. If it was a fairly new divorce agreement that came into play, then you take into consideration you know, the new rules. Okay, now let's talk about the IRA. So the IRA is an interesting one, which seems kind of straightforward and easy, but actually can be fairly uh, complex given basically different scenarios. So let's first thing to note is an IRA deduction is something as a tax preparer, you're probably going to be dealing with no matter what type of clientele you have more well off versus uh, less well off. And it's one of those tax planning things that you can do even at the tax preparation time, which is unusual because most tax planning things are, are stuff that has to be done before the end of the year. So in other words, if I go to the form 1040, if I'm doing taxes for 2023, if I want to change the client's behavior to, to benefit their taxes, usually I have to convince them to do something before the end of the tax year of 2023, even though we're actually filing the return if it's before the extension date by April 15th of 2024. But with the IRA, we have up until the filing point of the tax return, not including extensions, April 15th, uh, 2024, to do some last minute planning, which might include investing in an IRA. So that's great because no matter where we stand, we can do the taxes and then see if there's a maximum or some amount that we can still put into a uh, an IRA. Many softwares have a an, 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 an analy analysis 
type of thing, which will help people with this kind of calculation. So in Lacert, it's here. So you can see here the, what, what I have thus far. In 2023, taxpayer could have contributed 6500 to an IRA with estimated tax savings of 1430 All taxpayers could have contributed 6500 to a Roth as well uh, Roth assuming no other changes contributions can be made up until April 15th that's great tool to have you have to make sure the data input has been properly input to see that that has been populated properly which we'll take a look at in a second but that allows you to say hey let's do the tax return let's get it done before the extension date and let's see if we have any last minute uh, IRA contributions that you can make now when people ask you general questions about an IRA, then the, the general idea is going to be, well, if you have access to like a 401k plan, which would be through a W-2 employee, in other words, if I go to my data input W-2 wages, if on the W-2 form, you have the checkbox indicating that they have access to a retirement plan, even if they haven't really in contributed to it, if they have access uh, to it, then that might limit their capacity to put money into an IRA. And typically, it is beneficial to put the money into the retirement plan through the employer as opposed to an IRA because you can usually put a whole lot more money into those plans than you could with an IRA and you might get matching uh, along with it, the employer putting money into it as well. However, if it's a 401k plan through the employer, I don't have the capacity to basically say, okay, let's do your taxes and then see if you have any money left over to put into your 401k plan for 2023 when I did your taxes sometime before April 15th of 2024, right? Because the year has ended. So I can't, I can't go back and adjust your withholdings for payroll uh, back before the year had ended. So, so with, with the 401k plan, you have to make the planning up front to try to max out the withholdings that are taken out uh, that, that if, if you have the cash flow to do it, right? Whereas the IRA is something that you might be able to do afterwards. Now, even if your spouse, if you're married and your spouse has access to a retirement plan, that could possibly impact the, the IRA's in a married uh, situation, the capacity or ability to put money into an IRA in that situation. So in those cases, what's your, the basic idea would be, hey, look, you might still be able to put money into an IRA. It kind of depends on your income circumstances. If you have high income, it's likely you won't be able to because you had the capacity to put money into a 401k or a 403b. And if you were able to double up those things, that would be kind of excessive taking advantage of of the tax code. That's the general idea. Now, if you don't have access to a retirement plan, this thing is not checked, uh, then you don't have access to it, even though you are a W-2 employee because your employer doesn't have a 401k plan set up or anything, then you would think you would be able to put money into an IRA for, for the most part and put the maximum contribution into the IRA 6,500 or possibly if you're over the 57,000 500 would be the the general idea now if you are if you don't have w-2 wages and you get your money instead from a schedule c for example or some kind of pass-through entity like an s corporation or a partnership then you would have your income reported on the schedule c and if you don't have any retirement plan with the schedule c then again you would think that you would have the capacity to put money into and IRA. However, you might say, hey, look, I'm limited to only 6,500 to put money into an IRA. Whereas if I had a 401k plan, I could put way more than that in usually. Then what, what am I, what can I, what can I do on the, on this to put more money in? Could I set up my own type of 401k plan for the Schedule C? Well, you could, but it's typically easier to, to set up a, a, a simple or a, a SEP. So these types of plans, if they're a Schedule C type of business, basically could kind of replace the money that you would be putting into an IRA if you have self-employment income and not the capacity to put money into an employer plan of a 401k plan. 
So, and for the SEP, for example, might give you that same capacity, which is great for a small business of actually being able to do the taxes first and then figure out how much money you can max out to put into the SEP uh, after you do the taxes. And I think you can even do that after extensions, including uh, extensions. So, so, so make sure you understand that the rules, I'm, I'm not gonna wanna get into the details of the SEP and the simple right now, but the general idea is that if you have these set up, the reason you set them up is because you're gonna basically have that for a sole proprietorship as opposed to the IRA, typically because you can put more money into them and therefore get more tax benefit. Now also note that all of these plans typically favor more wealthy individuals. These are things that high income individuals often are pushing for because although the argument is that they're trying to get everybody to save for retirement, the reality of the situation is you can only, <laughs> you can only put, take advantage of these tax benefits if you have cash flow, if you have excess money that you're not spending on current necessities so that you can then put the money into an IRA uh, and then get the tax benefit from the IRA. Or if you're talking about a SEP in these plans, you're putting tens of thousand dollars into, a, into these plans. You've got to have the cash flow basically generally uh, to be able to do that. So that's going to be, of course, the a detrimental factor for many people. Do you have the money to put in? So when you're doing the tax planning, you're, you're gonna be want to think if you have a SEP or something like that, make sure that you save up some money so that we can do that last minute tax planning uh, if you can. With an IRA, same thing. If you, if you haven't put money into a 401k plan or something, or even if you have, try to save up a little bit of money so that we can do that last bit of tax planning and see if you can still put money into and IRA. Okay, so let's jump on over if and let's say that they did not have access to a retirement plan. Well, I could max out the IRA by putting a one here, for example, and that would pull in the max in this case of the 6500. And then I'm going to say that pulls down to the bottom goes into the form 1040 100,000 minus the 6,500 brings us to the 93,500, 13,850 standard deduction, 79,650 of the taxable income. I can mirror that over here in my worksheet, making adjustments to income. And I'll just say we have an IRA. Let's do another one here and say we have IRA. And there could be two of these because they could be a married couple. So I'll make another... Uh, I'll make this black and white, da -da, black and white. And then I'll say, I'll give it two blue cells here for the data input. Da -da. And then I'll say the first one was 6,500, which was the max. You might put the max over here, max, and then, and then uh, uh, over, I think 50 is the age. If they're over 50 is 6,500 to 7,500, just so you have that. You could say, okay, this is the max of the 6,500. Total uh, IRA, duh, duh. we'll sum that up here. Bop, 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 bop. And then we'll put some boxes around that too, maybe. Sum it up. Sum it up, little darling. 100,000 minus 6,500, 93,500, 93,500. That's what we have here. And 13,850, okay, 79,650, uh, 79,650. Page two, calculating the tax at the 12,836. So now we're at 12,836 on the tax calculation. All right, let's go back on up and complicate things a bit. Let's say that they are they are older than 50 and I try to put my max contribution in. So we're going to say do, 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 calculator calculations and we're going to say that we have 2023 minus let's say 53. So they were born in 1970. So that's why the date of birth is going to be important to make sure that you have that accurately populated so that calculations like this will prop populate properly as well. Schedule one is duh, 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 duh. page two is now calculating at the 7,500. Here's your worksheet. 
that's basically uh, doing that calculation. All right, let's bring it back to the normal. So we see that we could see the age maximum contribution change. Let's bring it back to to, to do the date of birth is back to let's just say 1978, let's say, and then we're going to go okay. So now it's back to the 6000 and 500. All right, so now let's say uh, that if I go back on over and say income, that this box is checked off. Now remember, I had W2 income. If I forget to check that box, then it's gonna it's gonna improperly say I can put money into an IRA. So be very careful with that. We should be able to. Now I'm gonna check that box, and that would mean that this box one is not including the amount that was taken out of my paycheck and put into a 401k plan. I'm going to imagine that that happened down here, uh, the, the 10,000, right? So we took 10,000 out, went into a 401k plan, which means that box one might be different than the social security, right? Which might be now 90,000. And, and this one might now be 90,000 on a W2, right? But the, the bottom line is now this box is checked off. So it's going to confuse my calculation. Here's my worksheet. It has now disappeared. Why? Because if I go into here, we can see our, our calculation. I won't go into it in detail if you want to uh, dig down on it. But it basically says, you know, we're not able to, to put money in because we ha had access to the 401k plan and our income is fairly high, right? So, so what if I brought my, uh, what if I brought this down to like 70? Thousand. I'm just going to keep this at seventy thousand, or this. Well, this would be sixty thousand, maybe sixty thousand. Okay. So then, what would happen? Uh, now I'm back up to uh, the the six thousand five hundred, even though I had that box checked off, and there's some phase out, you know, between that. Let's say it was eighty thousand, and this is going to be seventy thousand seventy thousand see if i can hit a hit the spot in the middle now 1950 so if i go into this you could see the calculation 83000 minus 80000 3000 and then 1950 so again i don't want to get into the weeds too much in detail but you can check a, take a look at that schedule to see what the phase outs are now you're probably not going to memorize all the phase out amounts when you're giving someone like talking to them because you're going to help the software will help you to do that but the general scenarios of uh do you have access to a retirement plan or not you want to kind of keep in your mind as to whether or not they might be able to put money into an ira that's the general idea now if they're married then then you have two spouses which which gets even more complicated because now you have two individuals both of which could have access to their own uh, IRAs. This is where it gets weird because usually if you think about two separate returns that come together, they've come together of one heart, one soul, one tax prepare, pay, payer. But uh, with regards to the IRAs, it's usually by social security number, right? So now they're still kind of separate, but married uh, and so on. So if I go back on over and we say, for example, that they're married now. So let's say married filing joint and so now you have uh, two of them. And so let's go back on over. And so now we've got Adam and Jane. Okay. And then if I go to uh, the schedule one, page two, the adjustments in terms of the maximum limits are going to change. So, so now I have the 6,500. Here's our worksheet uh, in this case, breaking it out for taxpayer and spouse. If I go back on over, and maximize for both. So now I'm gonna to try to maximize for the taxpayer and the spouse. Now we have the 13, uh, the 13,000. And you can see the calculation uh, broken out here for the 13,000, even though one of them had access to a 401k plan. And so if I go back on over to the income, now let's imagine that we had another one w2 this one's for the spouse let's imagine the spouse 
doesn't have access to a retirement plan and they made, let's say, 100,000 and da, 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 da. Okay, and so then we're gonna go back on over and say, okay, schedule one, now it's been limited to 6,500, which is kind of what you would expect because now it's it's basically the one that has access to the retirement plan uh, uh, doesn't get access to the IRA, right? But the other one that didn't have access to the retirement plan still basically has that maximum contribution of the 6,500, which is kind of the result that you would expect. But if I make it higher than that, if I go to 200,000, they still don't have access to a retirement plan. And then I go back on over here. Now it's been wiped out completely. And so, so again, the, it gets a little bit complicated is the general scenario when you think about all the different combinations between a married couple when one has access or neither of them have access to like a retirement plan. So, so that my recommendation would be that you have the general idea of what's happening and then, of course, rely to some degree on the software to get down to the nitty gritty details and use your analytics tool to help you with that last minute, minute kind of tax planning situation. Now, also note that if you didn't have any earned income, then you might not be able to put money into an IRA as well. So let's go back to the first scenario. And let's say that it was a single uh, filer and we're going to go to uh, wages and let's say let's say delete and uh delete and let's say they had income but it was all like dividends so we had corporation one and they had like you know sixty thousand of dividends but no w-2 income so now if i go back on over we have sixty thousand of income and so on uh but schedule one it's not populating for uh, the, the, the IRA because there was no, that would be passive income and there was no like uh, earned income in that situation. So that's another scenario that could come up, which is less common. Usually the confusion comes up with this idea of what kind of retirement plan are they putting money in? And if I have access to another retirement plan, can I still put money into an IRA? And how much can I put in and how long do I have to be able to put it in there?